remember how I, uh, a few times I've said this in the lead up to this class in, in, in the last couple of weeks, there were a couple of big um, things we need to always keep in mind for this period. And the first is, of course, the invention of the cotton gin, which is an 18th century invention, but more but really gets going in the 19th century, makes combing cotton, getting rid of the seeds much more, much more easy, much more mechanical, much more uh, efficient. So cotton suddenly becomes an extremely expensive, extremely inexpensive commodity to use for the production of cloth. And this helps not only uh, spread the cotton and spread the, the cotton industry and the cotton weaving industry and the um, uh, textile mill industry dramatically. It of course means that slavery expands dramatically because all cotton in North America, uh, almost all cotton in North America is produced in the South and uh, a, an awful lot of it is produced by slave labor. So at exactly the time when some of the founding generation thought that slavery might be dying or there might be, or that slavery might be sort of eventually on its way out or on the gradual decline to die. It is revived by, by the cotton gin. The second um, invention is later. It's more in the port in the period we're talking about. And that is the invention of the steel skeleton or steel infrastructure of buildings. Now, this is really boring. This sounds really boring. And it's a very Pittsburghy thing to talk about. But essentially what it is, is what you're what people are able to do with with steel, which is lighter and stronger than masonry, is build um, an interior skeleton of buildings uh, made of steel. And then the exterior is made of bricks or stone or whatever, but that exterior is very, compared to the way they used to be, the exterior is very uh, thin compared to building a house straight up from the foundation up made of bricks or stone. And this meant that buildings could grow up, be built much higher. And this, this is where we see the, the, where sort of towns, some big towns turn into really what we, what we think of as modern cities now. And, and, and small towns turn into larger towns. Um, there's, a, there's a possibility of doing much more commerce in town and also there from, and, the, and the, the, the ability to pack these, for lack of a better word, skyscrapers uh, together means that a lot more business can be concentrated. It's very big development. It also means that Slave uh, plantation owners can maintain themselves on their plantations out in the country in more um, uh, disconnected, but also connected ways. The, the, the town becomes more important as, a, as a, an entrepot of co commerce and, and, the, and the, the, the trading of, of whatever commodity, slave, cotton, sugar, a slave, um, tobacco, cotton, sugar, okay? But you're making all this money from the town, but you're able to spend it and live outside uh, on the plantation. So you get these massive plantations like Arlington and stuff like that in this period. And the third thing just to remember is, you know, don't, don't, don't fall into this trap that a lot of us fall into, including me, that... You know, the North is sitting by idly while all this is going on, and the North is full of, full of anti-slavery people, full of uh, firebrand abolitionists and stuff like that. Well, all the, almost all the cotton textile mills are in the North because they're becoming industrialized by this period. Uh, Massachusetts is just chock full of, of textile, textile mills, and upstate New York is chock full of textile mills. And so the Northern businessmen are, are profiting tremendously off of Southern slave produced cotton. Okay. So there is an interest for Northern businessmen to keep Northern business interest to keep slavery going, not necessarily keep slavery going because a lot of them, it's one of these tremendous human, uh, contradictions you know people carry around all these contradictions within themselves a lot of big cotton 
uh, cloth producers were were abolitionists, but they're they're used to getting the cotton in a certain in a certain way at a certain price, uh, in a certain volume. Okay, and if you were to tinker with that, let's say uh, abolish slavery, let's say January first, eighteen fifty. The, the competitive cotton market, the, the having, having to Im, Im, import or create a competitive cotton market in the South would have taken some time and there would have been disruptions and it would have been uneven the flow of cotton. So there are a lot of people who are definitely in the North who are definitely profiting off slavery and who, you know, in the back of their mind, don't mind profiting off slavery. So it's not a complete North-South divide. That starts to grow later on okay so this is very very important to remember that these three uh things are going on just one second i have to do a massive cough i'll be right back Um, okay, where was it? All right, so, so, but where does all this start? This all starts in the Old South and the idea that cotton is king. Cotton replaced sugar as the world's major crop that was produced by slave labor in this 19th century. And this we're talking about now 1815 to 1840, 1850. And of course, the strength of American slavery rested on cotton. Three-fourths of the world's cotton supply came from the Southern United States. And by the way, later on in the 19th century, the screw pro propeller is invented and you can have this sort of uh, steamships and things like that. And the paddle wheel steamer is, is outdated. But uh, one thing cotton actually, uh, and the increase in production of cotton boosts is the pr production of sales. Sales, as you know, are massive pieces of cloth and sail cloth itself has to be has to be um, of a certain type of cotton very strong very sturdy well if there's a there's a brief sort of burst in the uh, number of ships being built because you can now start to have a lot of sailing ships where before before you couldn't um, the growth in cotton also helps produce the growth in durable work clothes. Uh, some people argue that the gold rush in California wouldn't have happened without denim jeans, which of course made it made of cotton, made of very thick, heavy cotton, very law, hard wearing and all that sort of thing. And those things have all these subsidiary industries that grow up with them. So the sales, uh, the sales, right, require grommets to uh, require, uh, yeah, grommets to, to, Lash them to the to the uh, to the or to, or to hoist them or whatever they call it to uh, up the, up the mast. Levi's jeans, if you will, even to this day have little rivets in them, right? They probably don't need them anymore, but they have them. Uh, well, this was you know this was one of the things in the 19th century. So so uh, cotton has an increase in cotton production leads to an increase in cotton cloth which leads to an increase in all these sort of subsidiary industries that support that. It just grows and grows and grows and grows and grows. Okay. The cotton in the U.S. is not only, the cotton in the South is not only sent to textile mills in the North, uh, but also to Great Britain. Great Britain, and in, in fact, in the North of Great Britain and in Southern Scotland, because there's a lot of water power, a lot of river power. Uh, there's a, just an explosion in the number of, of textile mills, textile mills. Um, and, and you have in Britain, even though Britain is, uh, abolishes the slave trade in 1807, eventually abolishes slavery in 1833 in the British Empire, you know, it's the British, um, uh, um, uh, business interests are making a ton of money off American cotton and therefore making a ton of money off of uh, uh, American slavery. Cotton is, is America's most important export. Okay. Well, by 1860, it represented over half of the, um, uh, of the U.S. exports um, worldwide. Okay. Now, as I say, the slave trade is banned in 1807 by the British um, uh, Empire. It's enforced by the British Navy. 
enforced pretty well by the British Navy, and it, uh, but also the Constitution uh, bans it. Uh, the U.S. bans it in in 1820 because it. It, it said that it's, it's essentially in the constitution, the slave trade is allowed to exist for a certain number of years. But that doesn't mean that the supply of slaves goes down. In fact, the supply of slaves goes up because of what's called natural increase. Slaves in the United States produce more slaves uh, through breeding. There were more than 2 million slaves sold from 1820 to 1860 within the United States, okay? not being imported from Africa. And as I mentioned, these towns becoming cities and these cities becoming uh, places of intense commerce and highly concentrated commerce. Well, there's there, the offices of slave traders expand. Uh, there are big, big uh, auction houses for slavers for, for uh, auctioning off slaves. There are public slave markets, right? It, it becomes a very big and concentrated uh, commodity. Slaves themselves become a literal. Uh, commodity. Okay, so this is what people call the second middle passage. Is not not the middle passage between Africa and the North American continent, but the middle passage between where you were born and where you were ultimately taken to be sold, and where you then moved on by your new owner. So slaves are moving uh, a tremendous amount. And just to reiterate what I said, it, it it shapes the lives of all Americans, Northern merchants and manufacturers obviously participate in the slave uh, economy and shared as profits ships as i mentioned before banks also we always forget banks and insurance and and things like that are very important and because there's a lot more money going around there's a lot more sort of money management needed and these things become modern industries of their own now having said all that and having said how important it, the, the cotton and slavery are, are to the North as well as the South, the South, the Southern economy, the Southern economy is fundamentally different from the Northern economy. Okay, now I don't, I don't, I don't like to do this because, uh, generally speaking, movies are terrible indicators of, of what actually happened in history. But there's an interesting scene in the early stages of Gone with the Wind. I don't know if you've seen Gone with the Wind. Uh, it's one of these movies that history professors hate with a passion because it's so, um, it just, it uh, glorifies the old South. It, it, uh, it has all these obedient plantation loving slaves on it. And it's just, it's about as ahistorical as it can get. Um, but there is this uh, scene early on after the war breaks out or the war is starting to break out or the Fort Sumter is fired on. I can't remember exactly. And all these uh, planter men, all these uh, the sort of elite men of the area are all gathered in at Terra, the house that the O'Hara's uh, owned, uh, the plantation the O'Hara's owned. And they're sitting there all with all, all this fervor, all the Southern pride. We're going to whip those Yankees. We're going to, we're going to beat them. Southern men are better officers. They're more gallant. They're more gentlemanly. They're better fighters. They have a more, more, Ideolo they have a stronger ideological commitment to their cause, right? It's for the tradition, the way of life. Northerners are just dirty money men. You know, we're, we're going to defeat them like we would defeat an army of robots. Uh, and this goes around. Lots of people are saying this, and it's a quarter of a rabble rousing crowd uh, in this, in, in Mr. O'Hara's uh, big uh, parlor. And, and off to the side, Rhett Butler, paid by Clark Gable, says, well, yeah, but remember, guys, that, you know, there, there are, I don't know, 50 cannon factories in the north. Um, there are, the, and there are none in the south. There are all sorts of uh, shipwright companies in the north. We only have a few in the south. Bullet manufacturers are common in the North. They're not common in the South. Rifles come from Springfield, Massachusetts in overwhelming numbers. They don't come from Springfield, Mississippi, if there even is a spring. He, he takes this line of argument that yes, we may be, we may have sort of manliness and, and, and ideology on our side, but the North has got, got the industry. Now, I, I don't know that whether there were zero 
cannon manufacturers in the South, or zero, zero cannon factories. But it's not a bad uh, it's not a bad way to think about the differences between um, the North and South. There were fewer larger cities in the in the South, even though even though there's this transformation that I uh, talked about. The cities that were mainly centers for Greek gathering and uh, shipping co cotton and, and dealing with slave trading. They did not necessarily move into manufacturing. In, in, in any great degree, uh, certainly not in really in an export way, the way a lot of northern cities were uh, did, had. Uh, New Orleans, by the way, is the most important city in the, the only New Orleans is the only city of significant size in the South. Is the only city that really has this sort of uh, structure, the sort of flow of commerce, the sort of flow of of uh, business the way New York does in the North, okay? Both port cities, both uh, dealing with a lot of different countries. Um, a lot of things are exported from New Orleans and imported from New Orleans, but that's the only, that's really the only place. And uh, uh, New Orleans is very diverse. There's obviously French culture there, Caribbean culture, um, but it's also sort of moving stuff from New Orleans into the rest of the South is harder than it is to move from New York to uh, other places in, in the East, okay, in the North. Okay, so <clears throat> New Orleans is the only city of any decent size in the South, but it's not as powerful, as efficient as New York and Boston and Philadelphia. Okay? So this is, a, this is a problem. The, the, the little, the cities in Virginia, the cities in South Carolina and Georgia are, are tiny by comparison. And this, this means that they're not going to work uh, um, as well in, in what becomes perhaps the first industrial war. The South produces less than 10% of the nation's manufactured uh, goods, pardon me. Now, having said all that and having given you the idea that the South is based almost exclusively on cotton and slavery and don't, by that, I don't mean to forget sugar and tobacco, but there are a couple of, of, of important caveats. Three fourths of white Southerners didn't own any slaves. Okay, they sort most Southerners, most white Southerners lived on sort of self sufficient farms. Okay, self sufficient. They were feeding themselves and trading with their name, sort of immediate neighbors. They weren't really integrated into the market economy. That's one of the reasons why the South didn't develop much industry. Now, even though most whites didn't own slaves, they supported slavery, okay? Uh, and it, there's a sort of bond in the South. There's a very interesting, very complicated relationship between men, groups of men in the South. It's, it's absolutely fascinating to read about. Um, there's a sort of bond in the South over race between white men, poor white men, and rich white men. Lots of poor white men like Andrew Johnson who become president after Lincoln uh, dies um, are, very, are very, very against the planter class. They don't like this hierarchical English aristocratic sort of st structure that exists in the South, but they're still pro-slavery, okay? So they support the idea of a slave society even though they might hate the, the slavery elite so for instance so that in the in the way that uh some um people in the united states uh you know a guy working in a gas station how hates the fact that jeff bezos has 85 billion or 800 billion dollars or whatever he has that he didn't pay any taxes last year or whatever the story is but he uh he so he hates that but he doesn't hate capitalism okay very firmly, very strongly uh, believes in that. So my, most white Southern, Southerners support um, the slavery because you know, there's this sort of shared bonds of regional loyalty, uh, raci racism, and, and kinship ties. And they also see, as I talked about last week, a sort of growing abolition movement in the North, and there's a natural, natural pushback. Oh, wait a minute, don't tell us what to do about... Um, uh, about how we run our, our economy, okay? So even though this is, this is one of the great tragedies of the South, it's poor Southern white farmers 
are not only not profiting in slave produced cotton the way they're, they're, the rich elites are, but because of all these reasons, they bought into the story that slavery is a good thing, even though slavery kind of works against them and their own interests. This is a very common thing in history. Is European history is full of this sort of crap. Um, people being convinced of stuff uh, of a large ideology that actually hurts them in the in, in their daily lives. Um, anyway, uh, even even in the slave owning class, though the number of uh, of slaves per family is pretty small. Most slave only family holding families only earned five slaves or fewer. Uh, 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 the, oh, uh, sorry, I have misphrased that. Well, most the vast majority of slave owning friends own five or fewer slaves. Oh, there are only about 2,000 families in the South that own 100 slaves or more. But owning slaves and owning lots of slaves, and particularly inheriting slaves, was a way, was a way to wealth, status, influence. So all the people in the state assemblies, the state legislatures in the South, almost all of them are major slave owners. All, certainly all the congressmen and senators from the South are major slave owners. Uh, if I have this right, the first five of the first five presidents, four of them are slave owners for major slave owners for Virginia and the uh, Jackson. Five out of the first seven uh, are, were slave owners. So the only two non-slave owners were John Adams, the second president, and John Quincy Adams, the sixth president, his, you know, from Massachusetts. So they have an outsized uh, uh, influence on, um, uh, uh, on the national stage. Slavery is very profitable. The slave owners, uh, you know, they, they look at market prices in cotton. They're dealing heavily in 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 dollars and cents that almost all slave owners obviously a big plantation owners obviously had lots of overseers and accountants and things like that to work for them but the slave the 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 master of the plantation he's going through the books you know they're paying attention to market news from london market news from new york market news from philadelphia um and on and on and on and paying attention to their their costs and everything and this is a it's a terrible sort of thing to be uh, happy that, that that there's so much information because of slavery, but historians are able to, to look into the nature of slave of slave plantations and how they operated to a tremendous degree because so many incredible amounts of detail were kept. I mean, they just they just uh, you know they're paying attention. They're, they they believe this is a good system and they and they and they want to make sure that they're making as much money as they possibly could. Plantation mistresses, mistresses cared for six slaves. They oversaw the domestic servants. Uh, some of those were slaves, some of those weren't. Some of them were slaves, some of them weren't. Uh, and they supervised the plantation when the master was away. Now, this is important because in an age of increasing professionalism, right, in the North, the North has this uh, period of the sort of professional qualifications, not necessarily college degrees or, but, but sort of apprenticeships and things like that, that prove that you're a good bookkeeper, prove that you're a capable banker, prove that you're a capable printer, whatever that can, that sort of stuff starts to matter more than actual family ties when it comes to a business person. So a business person in the North is just as likely to hire a pro from outside the family as he is to hire his nephew just because he's his nephew that's not the case in the south in the south it th there there are these professionals there are accounts and all this stuff but an awful lot of them are family members and more importantly when the slave owner when the master of the, of the plantation goes off to richmond to uh the virginia assembly or goes off to uh washington for the u.s congress or whatever it's the mistress of the house. It's the fam. It's the highest ranking family member who takes care of the of the plantation. Not necessarily who works the accounting or works the books, but when Thomas, when uh, 
when James Madison is away, his what you know, any big issues that come up, his wife deals with them. Okay. Uh, maybe not like I said, the detail stuff, the sort of mechanical stuff, but but some 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 uh, policy decision, if you will, has to be made. It's done by a family member. That's an extremely important difference, and it only increases in as the North starts to move further and further towards a professional society. Don't get me wrong. There's plenty of family uh, nepotism in the North. There's plenty of, there are plenty of firms where people hand down their stuff from father to son, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But it's much more common in the North to, to have uh, um, a family hierarchy. Okay. So this is why they, and they believe very strongly in this hierarchical agricultural ag ag agrarian system. Okay, they they also start to convince themselves that, for instance, like I'm the father of this plantation. I'm not just the master and the owner. I'm the father. I'm responsible for um, everybody on it. I'm responsible for my slaves, even though they buy and sell slaves as if they're machines and tools and just horrible dehumanization of them. Slave owners start slave plantation owners believe in increasing uh, intensity that they are the sort of um, parents of everything they, they survey, so to speak. And this, this helped build up this idea, especially among Southern men, a Southern code of honor. They're still dueling in the South, which is uh, outlawed in almost every nor Northern state. It's either outlawed or it basically just doesn't happen anymore. One of the reasons the Hamilton, the duel between Alexander and Hamilton and Aaron Burr was so famous is because they had to uh, dueling was banned in new york they had to go to new jersey to 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 do it and not only is it because these two guys were famous so uh, and well known and important so, you know so it's it's an important event that, that they're trying to shoot each other um uh, dueling was rare in the north well it's not so rare in the south okay but perhaps the biggest thing for our purposes really is to try to understand how the pro-slavery argument intensifies during this uh, period. Remember how I've talked many times as the class has gone on, the, uh, the 18th century Southern mind, especially the planning elite, especially the intellectuals like Jefferson, Madison, Monroe, uh, and Washington, uh, believe that slavery was uh, sort of a necessary evil. Well, we're, 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 we're bothered by it, intellectually bothered by it. They don't, they don't actually bother to change the way they behave. But, the, you know, in the back of their mind, their conscious sort of conscience, or they say their conscience plagues them. Uh, there's a big debate about, about uh, uh, how, how, how true that is, especially in the case of Thomas Jefferson. Um, but but it's it's the way things are. It's the way things always have been. The whole end of the whole South is built on slavery. It's this necessary evil. Well, that changes after this, after the cotton gin and after all these innovations make slavery in, enormously more profitable. Right? It doesn't no one no one in the, in the pro-slavery part of the South anyway sees slavery as on its way out or uh, on a slow decline to oblivion. They see it as growing. And therefore, they kind of built up this own justification that it that it's a good thing. Okay, it's not a necessary evil; it's a positive thing. Slavery was what made Rome great. Slavery is what made uh, what made uh, Egypt great. Built these great empires, and on and on and on. So there's there's a, there's of course a great deal of white supremacy. There's there's some biblical sanction. Remember, the Bible is sort of fifty fifty on slavery. Half the time, it's complaining about. The Israelites in bondage. The other half of the time is talking about, well, the slave has to be obedient to his master and uh, and other stuff. There's a there's a there's a real problem for Christians in the Bible when they're dealing with slavery if they want to f follow the Bible in a sort of literal sense, fundamentalist sense. Um, <coughs> sorry. Okay, but I, it's really this historical precedent for slavery and the fact that slavery through the, through these two or three generations that we're talking about seems to be growing in importance and, and growing in, in profitability and making all these other things possible that say, well, you know, it's, it's bad, but it's, it's not just bad, but it's one of these things you have to live with. It's good. The university of Virginia is built on 
slavery, slave profits and whatever. So it's because of slavery we're allowed to have this huge, uh, great enlightenment institution um, and on and on and on. And another thing that, that pro-slavery people start to argue is that slavery, if it does nothing else, it, it, means, it, it means a sort of equality for whites. Yes, yeah, sure, most white people in the South don't own slaves. Most white people in the South are small planters. Most people in the, white, in the South are so, um, uh, self-sustaining farmers or, or community-sustaining farmers. They're not really interested, in it, but, but they are above Black people. They are free and they are not sla- they're not slaves. They're free and therefore their, e- their freedom makes them equal with, with other whites. Okay? Mod- slavery, because of the cotton gin, was modern. In, in many ways, it was in tune um, with the times. The slavery owners, we tend to forget this completely in American history because we forget about everything south of Florida. Slavery owners, uh, slave plantation owners communicated extensively with slave owners in, in the Caribbean and Cuba and Brazil and places like that uh, because of this sort of similar um, uh, uh, sort of feeling a similar background. A great number of Confederates, by the way, in the 1850s, people become it, Confederates. In the 1850s, they're talking about, well, wait a minute, we should form an American South that includes the Caribbean, right? And some of Central America, because after all, we're all slave only people. That, that's the defining thing in our, um, in our, um, in our lives. And they're able to use their power within the federal government to make sure that slavery isn't really tinkered with. The Fugitive Slave Law is passed early on in the century and it is is enforced very quickly, very strongly. Um, uh, As you know, the House of Representatives is, uh, the Southern states are overrepresented in the House of Representatives because of the three-fifths clause, the fact that there are two senators from every state, doesn't matter if you're practically nobody lives in your state or whatever, means that a lot of small Southern states, Georgia, have two senators, whereas a large state, New York, only has two senators. These, these are all things that make the South sort of, uh, that uh, by, uh, by, uh, by, tr- by new tradition, the new tradition is going to make the South um, more influential in the, in the federal government than it is, than it would be based on population. This is still true. Uh, and by the way, uh, uh, before, just let me make sure to drop this one thing in. Uh, we often, you often hear that the Senate is uh, a relic of slavery. The reason why every state, no matter how small or big it is, has two senators is because the slave states wanted to make sure they had they had uh, enough uh, the same number that all states were equal in that regard. Well, that, that's technically not true. What the real reason is because all states wanted to make sure they had equal representation in the Senate. Um, whether you were a small state or a big state, it had to do much more with your size than with how much uh, mm. than when you were slave or free. New Hampshire's tiny, for instance. So it, it, but of course it demands two senators. Rhode Island's very small, but it demand, demanded two senators uh, way back when. So it's not technically true that the, the, um, the um, Senate is built on slavery. In fact, if anything, the House of Representatives, the House of Representatives is more built on slavery than, than the Senate, but I digress somewhat. Although it just, I just hear that a lot in the media and I, because we're talking about the filibuster and the, Yes, the filibuster is a relic of Jim Crow, right? But it's, that does not necessarily mean the Senate was founded in the way I just described. Uh, where was I? Okay, so these are all the kind of promotions of the pro-slavery argument. These are kind of the, the, the way slavery in, w- in which slavery is protected in the South and maintained in the South. Now, what about abolition? It wasn't about the anti-slavery uh, uh, movements. Well. Between 1800 and 1840, slavery was abolished in most Spanish America, abolished in the British Empire, that's the Caribbean I'm talking about, uh, right? So that, that the, uh, 1833, the, uh, uh, slavery is ended in, in the British Empire. That's 1833, 1838, there's a sort of apprenticeship period, long 
story. Um, uh, and this changes the Southern way of, this changes the Southern justification for thinking, a justification for slavery in many ways. What happens is in, in the British empire, in the Caribbean, especially, uh, sorry, the, this is the third lecture of the day and the, and the throat is really getting bad. I still have this damn flu. In the uh, Caribbean, after 1833, the sugar trade suffers. The, profit, the profitability of the sugar trade goes down. And slavery proponents in the United States will look, look you know, the, the, you, you abolish slavery. Look what happens. Your economy goes down the tubes. Okay. So obviously, that's a bad thing. Okay. Um, the other argument that abolitionists make is yes, that was only that's only a temporary thing, because you're because you're freeing slaves, you're also uh, creating all these new markets because slaves then will become eventually, I hope is, consumers and purchasers in their own right. Um, so anyway, um, uh, the the abolition abolitionism is not only a moral moral drive, but there's there are economic drives. And there are in international drives. There's, there's this problem that Americans have at this time where that, that a lot of countries are very wary of trading with, with, with the United States. They, do, they trade with the United States. They do trade with it. But they, are, they don't like a lot of the fact that, that um, uh, a lot of their textiles and everything were, were produced by cotton. They don't like the fact, uh, American cotton they don't like the fact that american or caribbean or slave sugar is used to sweeten their tea or whatever there's a there's whole movements in britain and in europe about they're the anti-saccharides for instance the, this is these are sh people who boycott sugar in their tea boycott sugar in their coffee because these are the slave produced sugar and that's morally wrong so they take their coffee unsweetened and on and on and on there are people who try there, there are all sorts of you have this weird sort of uh, juxtaposition of these northern northern English uh, cotton manufacturers, cotton uh, textile manufacturers, who are also themselves anti-slavery. They want to build. They want to. They want to um, uh, uh, be textile manufacturers, but they want that to be based on free labor cotton rather than slavery. And they increasingly pressure parliament for tariffs, for, for other things to try to restrict slavery, diplomatic pressure to restrict slavery uh, in the United States. So that there's, off, there's an awful lot of uh, pressure internationally and nationally uh, 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 against slavery in the, um, um, in, the, in, in the South. Now I'm gonna have to, stop it here after half an hour or 40 minutes, whatever, because my throat really is giving out. But what, what are the things I want to stress? And there'll be more about this in the recorded lecture that I'll upload later. Uh, all of these pressures against slavery from the North, from uh, uh, international uh, spheres of influence, they just harden the resolve of the Southern attitude to southern white attitude towards slavery okay this just makes see on the one hand southern planters are making a fortune off um off of slavery small southern white farmers who don't uh make money off slavery but feel a, a racial kinship with, with 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 planters feel that that their their lifestyle and their traditions their way of lives are being threatened and this is this is in, this intensifies during this whole period that's why you get these whacked out radicals like jefferson davis who say the most outrageous things in, in defense of slavery uh, by the time the the, the civil war bre breaks out i mean they really do believe that jefferson davis is not, i don't know this for certain but i wouldn't be surprised at all if jefferson davis's grandfather was uneasy about slavery had these sort of competing notions in his head about slavery uh, in the same way that Thomas Jefferson did. Well, but Jefferson Davis is just a, just a, an out and out racial eugenicist, racial purist. He just, you know, the, in other words, it, there's a sort of not only lack of progress, but things go backwards in terms of, of racial relations and things get strengthened 
in terms of the belief in the morality of slavery for all, because of all these things um, um, uh, coming in and sort of bombarding slavery. Southern, white Southerners get very paranoid about this. So the constant, the, the, they're constantly under this worry that uh, we're smaller than the North, we're not as economically powerful as the North. Uh, the Northerners are not only busy in their factories, but they're busy doing their moralizing. We don't like a lot of these, um, these uh, spiritual things that are happening and these religious revivals and reform movements in upstate New York, a lot of which, a lot of which are uh, uh, abolitionists. You know, we need to, and I don't want to say they sit down and say, and, and uh, have a, a, a meeting like the, the, the people that did it, Tara in the movie Gone Within. They don't sit down and have a meeting and say, okay, now we need to, we need to come with, with, up with more justifications for slavery. It's just this kind of natural reaction. There's a fear that their, that their way of life or their beliefs uh, system is being threatened. And so they react against it. And the, the reaction they take is to increase the belief in slavery beyond, even beyond a logical and uh, economic point. There's a point by 18, the late 1850s where you, could, you can argue very, very um, uh, clearly that sugar especially uh, could be just as cheaply produced with free labor as as anything else uh, and that but but then but then the sugar plantation owners are, uh, uh, don't rebel they uh, well eventually rebel but they react by saying no slavery is a positive good we must have this this uh, racial hierarchy uh, but I'm going to stop in order to be able to record your recorded lecture with your with the pictures and everything right right there. Any uh, questions or concerns or problems? No? Okay, well, Joe, I will, I will solve this problem we're having with your uh, grade on, the, on that assignment uh, one, and uh, your discussion agenda is up. The uh, podcast, which you've been signed for this week, is up on Canvas. So I will see all of you on Thursday, okay? Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you.